1998, I found myself at Gonzaga University um, laying in bed with like the blankets up over my head. Every little sliver of light that came into the room was like piercing right into the back of my left eyeball. Have you ever had this experience? Just piercing, crushing headache. Every drip of the sink was just crashing through my skull and my stomach was in pain. Like my abs were cramping up from having spent most of the day retching everything I'd eaten in the last week. But what happened was that my body was just going through a systematic shutdown of a completely unsustainable lifestyle. Now, this might sound like it's some sort of thing about like drinking or partying, and that's what it wasn't, okay? What it was was me trying to chase a formula for success that wasn't working. When I started, when I started high school, I was a pretty good student. And so I worked kind of hard at that, right? Um, and I had some success, and so people said, oh, you're doing good at that, but you need to do more. So, Josh, you need to like take harder classes. So I would take these harder classes. And then they go, oh, well, that's not enough. You need to be well-rounded. Has anybody heard that before? Right, you rolled your eyes. That's how I feel about it now, too. You need to be well-rounded. So I, ran, I went and joined a sport. I wasn't good at it. I you wrestling? You were pretty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're the one who had to drive me home when I got my head injuries from that. Um, and then it was like, oh, well, Josh, you need a community service, too. You gotta have a good resume. You gotta look good, right? And so I was doing Boy Scouts. I'd done Boy Scouts because I liked camping. But I needed a good resume, so I started doing all this community service stuff. When I got to college, I was, just took the same approach. Like, just, just do everything. And that's the secret to success. Does that feel familiar? Have you felt like maybe that's a bit of the pressure that you guys are experiencing? Mm -hmm. Just so you know, that doesn't stop. But the thing is, it also doesn't work. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about a different formula for success, a different formula for getting extraordinary results from your life, and really how to have a life of extraordinary impact. Okay, does that sound good? So this is not the how to get like 10% better, Class. This is not the like, oh, I want to kind of have, you know, an okay life. This is about extraordinary results. So it could be fun to figure out what that's all about. And it's going to be different than what you expect. Because I think somewhere along the way, it's, we'll just be good at everything, and that'll make you successful. And then somewhere along the way, you'll be fulfilled because you're successful. And I'm going to teach you a different formula that goes something like this. Learn to do one thing really well. And it's really fulfilling when you do. And that's how you find success. So it's kind of reordering the priorities a little bit. But more important to me is I want to hear why you came. So somebody in your life invited you, a friend, a, a relative, somebody like that invited you, or maybe you saw an email. We actually have no idea how uh, Mitchell's family found out about it. We're still guessing. But um, somehow, somebody knew somebody knew somebody that eventually said, hey, why don't you go to this thing? Why did you come? What are you hoping to get out of today? We're family. We're family? Okay. So she's family. They're just here to support me. We all have the same last name. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. Thank you for the support, Alexis. I appreciate Thank you. <laughs> okay. Support me. Well, okay. Beyond that, <laughs> you just say the reason you're here. So thank you. Curiosity about what you're going to say. What's that? Curiosity. So curiosity. Okay, just a, hmm, the one thing. That sounds, you know, better than reruns of The Walking Dead. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good. Kaylee? So I'm only three chapters into the book, but um, okay. I, I'm thinking, I, like, I've been with Public Links for almost two years, and I've been thinking, what is my one thing? What is my one thing? And I've never been able to figure out what my why is, or what is my one thing. Okay. And I feel like maybe I can get there. Okay. Got it. So Kaylee's an insider, right? Um, we both work for Keller Williams Realty, which is this company with all the red walls and stuff that you walked into. Um, they're blue in my office. They're blue in her <laughs> office, because apparently they didn't get the memo. Um, and so she used a couple of buzzwords there, her one thing and her big why. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what those two things mean. Um, very cool, but you've read this book. Now, who's never heard about this book before they heard about this class? Okay, good. So that's that's not unusual, even though it's a Wall Street Journal bestseller. It was the second best-selling book of two thousand uh, business book of two thousand thirteen. That's okay. Most people haven't heard of Gary Keller, right? Even though he runs the largest real estate company in the world, 
that's okay. What we do know is that, you know, he's a billionaire. He probably knows something about how to be successful. So it's worth checking out. Um, very cool. What else? What are the reasons do people come? Yeah. The potential to better myself. Potential to better yourself. All right. Would you have said that if your dad weren't sitting next to you? I would have said it. Right. All right. I'm just using you to change your Potential. Is that right? Spell checker? Yeah. doesn't have the red squiggles, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> potential to better myself. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Well, I saw how effective you are personally, okay. and so I thought I'd like to learn a little bit more of that. Oh, interesting. Um, would you be comfortable with me using the word modeling? Right yes. there, you saw a model that you wanted to follow? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Modeling. Cool. What else? Let's just do one more. Anybody? Okay, where'd you go? To learn. To learn. And what? I didn't really know this about ton of me, so ton of me, free sandwiches. You're good. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. So if we do all these things, right? If we satiate your curiosity, if we answer Kaylee's question about what a big why is and, and what the one thing is, give you something to potentially better yourself, show you a little bit about modeling success, and you learn something. Would that we say that's a win? That'd be like, that was really good use of 90 minutes. I feel really good about that. Yeah? Okay. So if you guys are as like, invested in this as I am, I think you're going to come out with this and a lot more. Does that sound fair? What I want to do is help you learn a way that I've been learning, and it's taken me about 20 years since that night when I was laying there, there in bed at the Gonzaga mm-hmm. University. It's taken me about 20 years to figure something out um, that we're going to talk about tonight. See, what happened is, as I was laying there, as I said, you know what, Josh, maybe, maybe you're not supposed to have an extraordinary life. Like maybe, maybe you just kind of suck, right? Like your body clearly doesn't take well to success, as it is like you're dying from this. So um, maybe success just isn't your thing. And that's a pretty disappointing place to be in, in life. And, um, and so I checked out of trying to be successful for about 10, 12 years. Um, and, and then some things changed for me, and I went, oh my gosh, this might be a different way to do this. And that's, that's what eventually led me to this place, which is learning about the one thing. We're going to talk about how to get an extraordinary life, and we're going to do it with three, three different ways. First, we're going to address some lies that exist in our culture about what success looks like and about what um, uh, achievement and productivity looks like. Okay? The second thing that we're going to do is we're going to learn uh, something called the focusing question. And the focusing question is the centerpiece of this book. It's the reason that, that your book on the back of it has a big question mark. Uh, because when you ask that question, a lot of things become really clear, get a lot easier. Okay? And the last thing is I'm going to give you two really cool tools uh, to, that can help you implement this. Okay? So address some lies, learn the focusing question, and give you two tools that you can walk out the door and start implementing tomorrow. Is that good? Okay? Everybody on board? Yeah, nice. All right, um, clicker, here it is. So this is me, I'm Josh Freeberg. I work with Keller Williams Real Estate Agent. Uh, real estate. Um, I've been a real estate agent for uh, coming up on six years now. Uh, I run about, a, you know, run a pretty good business, help a lot of people buy and sell homes. I'm also a Keller Williams University approved trainer, um, which took me about three years to get that certification. And then I'm becoming certified to teach a uh, full day and two day version of this class that you're learning about tonight. Uh, in two weeks, headed to Austin, Texas to learn that um, from Gary's team directly. So, um, so I found out that uh, nobody's watched this movie since the 90s, but there's this really great movie, you know it, yeah, City Slickers. Uh, there's this great movie called City Slickers, and City Slickers stars Billy Crystal. Uh, Billy Crystal is the city slicker, and he is 39 years old in this movie, uh, and is having a midlife crisis. And he decides to go off, him and his buddies, his crazy buddies, go off, and they're going to go on a, one of these dude ranch things, these like cattle drive deals. And he runs into Curly, played by Jack Pounce. Jack Pounce is an old time Western uh, movie star. And they have this great uh, conversation. Jack Pounce is the salty old cowboy, but he's happy. And Billy Crystal just can't quite figure that out. And I want to show you this really brief scene from the movie. 
right here. It has been edited. Cowboy leads a different kind of life. When I wear a cowboy. Can you hear that? I'm breathing. Can you guys hear that? Okay? Still means something to me, though. A couple of days. We'll move this herd across the river. Driving through the valley. Oh. <laughs> There's nothing like breaking in a herd. See, now that's great. Your life makes sense to you. <laughs> What's so funny? You city folk, you worry about a lot. My wife basically told me she doesn't want me around. She read it. <laughs> I'm just saying. How old are you? 38. 39. Yeah. You all come up here about the same age, same problems. You spend about 50 weeks a year getting knots in your rope, and then, and then you think two weeks up here will have time for you. None of you get it. Do you know what the secret of life is? No. What? This. Your finger? One thing, just one thing. You stick to that and everything else don't mean you. That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you've got to figure out. So there you go, Kaylee. <laughs> That's what you've got to figure out. <laughs> So, what did he say? It's the secret of life. I know, he bleeped it out, yeah. It's a really weird edit, too. I got it off YouTube. You stick, one thing, stick to that, and everything else doesn't mean much. Right? And that's the secret of what we're going to be talking about today, is how do we do that? How do we do that when we have so much pressure on us to do everything, do everything well? We have so much information coming in, we have so much going on. Um, and so we're going to start off by talking about those lies, those lies that lead us to feel like we have to. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about these six different lies. The first lie is this one, that everything matters equally. So how many people start their day with something that looks like this, or maybe their week with something that looks like a to-do list? Anybody? Yeah. Now when you have a to-do list, what do you, which one do you do first? The easiest one. Right? So we take off the easiest one, right? My to-do list. Hey, <laughs> check something off the to-do list. Oh, hey, now I'm at, you know, doubled my money here. Uh, and we start checking off the easy one, easiest ones first. So we get to the end of the day, what's left on the list? The most complicated stuff that we should have done. The most complicated <laughs> stuff. And how do we feel at the end of a day like that? I just have to do it all over again tomorrow. Well, there's this really important idea called the 80-20 rule. Uh, has anybody ever heard of the 80-20 rule? Yeah, you've heard of it? You've heard of it? The 80-20 rule was invented by this guy named Pareto out of Italy. It actually came out of economics. He looked at the world around him and said, it is weird. 80% of the wealth in Italy is controlled by only 20% of the people. He goes around and finds out that that's pretty consistently true. We also find that it's true in other areas of our life. Like with volunteer organizations, 20% 20, uh, 20 of the people do 80% of the volunteer work. For people who are in sales, 80% of their business comes from just 20% of their client base. Right? And over and over again, these types of things seem to play out, this idea of this 80-20 rule. Well, it also plays out in the activities that we do, <coughs> our goals that we have. As we look at the goals that we have, we go, oh my gosh, there's all these things that I have to do to be successful at that. But what we find is, is that about 80% of our success comes from just 20% of those activities. Well, that's pretty interesting. What we'd like to teach you is how to take this to the extreme. So I want you to take 20% of the 20%, which would be how much? What's that? I think four. it's five. Is it four or is it five? It's four. Is it four? Okay. So I'm going to round up. To five because what's 20% of five? One. one. Just one, right? Is that when we get extreme, when we take the 20, 80 20 rule to its extreme, and we do 20%, 20%, 20%, what we'll find is, is somewhere between 50 and 60% of our success will come out of just one activity. So I work in sales. 
what I know in selling real estate is that the one activity that I can do that will give you more than anything else is generating leads. Talking to people that might be interested in what I have to sell, right? Now there's a lot of other things that I have to do to run my business. I gotta check my books, and I gotta make sure the payroll goes out on time, and I gotta make sure the website looks good. But if I do that one activity, we get almost half of our success. Well, it turns out the same thing is true in a lot of different areas of our life. Okay. So the lie is that everything matters equally, and that's where we get into that weird place of like, oh, I just have to do everything. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. what, what's like an aha that somebody has from that? Just hearing that, that 80-20 rule, is that new to any of you? It's new to you, Caleb? Yeah. yeah. Is that shocking to anybody? That idea? No? Have you found that's true? I mean, most of us recently in school, what, uh, what would you say is like those 20% activities, those 20% those those of the activities that you did in school that would have given you like most of the success that you wanted? Studying. <laughs> Studying, yeah, absolutely, right? Doing the homework. That would be one of those 20% activities. Now, is there a lot to do when you're in school? I mean, not just the academics, but like, there's just a lot to do. Yeah. Right, but there's one thing right there that Kaylee identified that had a huge impact. So related to this idea of everything matters equally, and this is where we're going to camp for a little bit, because this is a tough one. And <coughs> this is tough for everybody right now, is multitasking. So who in here, no, I don't want to do this, because I'm going to walk you into a trap if I do. So I think that I'm good at multitasking. I will take the blame for this. I think that I'm good at multitasking. However, have you ever been on the phone with somebody? And you could just tell that they were watching cat videos on YouTube. Like you just knew, like they're not engaged in this conversation, right? And what were they doing? Uh huh. They were uh huh. Yeah. And they were watching cat videos, right? Or have you ever been that person who was talking to somebody on the phone and realized, oh, I'm not actually, I don't actually remember the last three things that they said. Oh, hey, sorry, I must have gone through a bad cell area. Oh, can you repeat that? I didn't catch what you said just now. Here's what happens. This is the science of multitasking. It's super interesting. So let's say I'm working on an activity, right? Well, let's say I'm, um, I'm applying for a job that I just found out about, and I'm writing an email to the potential employer, right? So this is a it's pretty important email, right, can you say? So I'm writing that email, and I'm typing along, I'm writing an email, I've got all of my focus and my attention on that. What happens is there's a distraction that comes up, okay? Tom sends me a text, right? So what happens is my brain has to stop what it's doing, it has to turn, reorient, download all the rules for this new activity, and then pay attention to it. And then when I'm done, yeah, I'll be there at seven, and put it down, and go back, what's the first thing that I have to do? Reread what I wrote. Oh, what was I saying? Hey, this job is really important to me. This will probably change the course of my life, but I don't have, you know, but I had to check this text real quick, right? What we found is, is that is costing us 28% of our productivity. So among American workers, 28% of the productivity goes out the window from one thing, multitasking. Isn't that crazy? And yet we're being taught over and over again that we're all really good at multitasking. And then it's okay, you just need to be better at it. And some people are good at it, some people aren't good at it, right? But what if, so who's working right now? Who has a job right now? What if I could get you a 28% raise tomorrow? Would that be interesting to you? Yeah, you'd you have a direct connection to my boss. Right, I do, yeah. Um, what if I could get you 28, what if I could get you out of work 28% earlier? Like what if you could get five day work week finished in four weeks? Would that be interesting to you? <clears throat> right? Chris, what if the guys that work for you were 28% more productive? That would be great, right? One of the things that we can all do is learn to get control of multitasking and learn how to not multitask. Now, I don't care if you're sitting watching the game and trying to carry on a conversation with a friend or, you know, watching the game and reading the newspaper. I don't care about that. 
what I hear about is that when you are doing the things that are most important for you and your life goals, that we learn how to get control of this. Now, I know some of you don't believe me yet, so grab the red piece of paper that you have in front of you. And you'll notice we've got these lines that say 1 through 10, uh, then A through J, and then you've got another, uh, another set of lines there. So we are in the area of town called Tannisborn. What I'd like you to do is write the numbers 1 through 10 as quickly as you can from left to right on the first line. Then you're going to write the letters A through J as quickly as you can from left to right. And then you're going to write the word Tannisborn, T-A-N-A-S-B-O-U-R-N-E, uh, as quickly as you can when I say go. Um, I'll put them up here in case you don't remember, uh, in case you needed a cheat. Uh, but do all those and go ahead and start now. When you're finished, I just want you to look up here. Oh, you're finished already. Wow, that was fast. Good. Good. Excellent. So the fastest were done in about uh, 14 seconds or so. 12 seconds, I think. And coming in on just about everybody. You are all this. I did. All right. So everybody's finished except Tom. Is that right? <laughs> Excellent. So that would be what we would call single tasking, serial single tasking, right? We just we did one thing. I wrote numbers, I wrote letters, I wrote a word. Okay? Now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to write the number one, then the letter A, then the letter T, then write the number two, then the letter B, and do it just the same way, and then the letter A. Okay? Now go through there. Go ahead and start now. Okay, so a couple of you should be finished, because it's been about 12, 14, 15. Nobody? Nobody? Oh, are you there? Okay. So you were the fastest when you two were the fastest ones that time? Potentially not as fast as the slowest ones from the previous half Interesting. So we're circling in on finishing. So, what was your experience like with that second one? What's that? Where was I? Where was I? Yeah. Let's go back and think. What else? What other experiences did people have? Confused. Confused? I felt confused while it was going on? Orientation. Oh, that felt the orientation felt different? Okay, you can go top down. What the heck's going on? Okay. Did anybody make mistakes? Yes. Yeah, you made mistakes. Um, so we know it took us longer, we felt confused and frustrated while it was happening, we made a mistake. Oh, how was your handwriting? How's your handwriting look? Better or worse? <laughs> worse. Okay, so the quality is lower. It took, so here's what you get when you multitask. Now why do you multitask? What's the temptation? What causes you to think, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and multitask right now. Get more done, get things done faster. What just happened? Did we get it done faster? Did it actually slow us down? Our quality was better or worse? Worse. Worse. And there were more mistakes. So as you start thinking about today, as we're, you start talking about like what is the one thing that you could do in your life that would mean the most to you? What is like a life goal that you have? When you're working on that, when you're working on, uh, or wait, potentially be better, Chad, when you're working on being better, do you want to engage in it in such a way that you make more mistakes, are slower, are confused and frustrated during the process, and your quality is poor? Probably not. Right. And so that's the thing about multitasking. What do you guys think? Am I totally all wet on this? Anybody? I'm going to take some water. So this is like a whole time participation kind of thing. It's good. You can talk. It's fine. What does all wet mean? Oh, being all wet, uh, being all wrong. Uh, you know, just like, yeah, that guy, yeah, so they would say, Don't laugh, you put that comment. Turkey. Oh, yeah, being all wet, it means, yeah, you're all wrong. That, I've heard that uh, there's a difference between men and women. 
in terms of multitasking and that actually women are better at it because of the way our brains are, the way our brains function. Right, so. With that or not? Um, so the research uh, does not support what you're saying, as I understand it. Now, I haven't read any primary research as it relates to that specific question. My understanding is it does, it does not work. Where multitasking, where people can kind of get away with multitasking, is when you are doing a cognitively simple activity and then monitoring a second activity that um, really lets itself be known. What happens, at least in conventional social roles, is that, um, that sometimes women are engaged in more things like that. And so like the classic example that gets used is, hey, if you're making the, the soup recipe that you make all the time, this is a pretty cognitively simple activity, right? Um, and you can do that while listening for the kids that are screaming down the hall, right? And this is a highly stereotypical example, I admit, okay? Um, but that's why that myth kind of gets into the culture, is that, that within that, those, that, that's, uh, that homemaker role, that really works. Now where it works, um, but where it gets difficult is people will do cognitively difficult tasks and then try and monitor a second activity. And that gets really difficult. And we, we recognize that we would actually be offended if somebody did that, right? Like if an airline pilot was checking their Facebook page during landing, right, they'd lose their job. Yes. Yeah, if the surgeon who's well, operating on our mom or our grandmother, you know, was checking email, we would be really upset about it. So um, there is a piece to that um, where that, that does come into the culture, but that um, the research doesn't seem to be bearing it out. Does that make sense? And then particularly we're talking about um, cognitively challenging activities. So if you're working on your novel, Right, or you're working on something that's going to take all of your cognitive faculties, then you know we're going to put those other those other activities aside to focus on that. Does that make sense? I feel like I walked right into a wall on that one, and probably. Well, I think it's really true. I, in my life, I see that with my husband and I. Uh -huh. I see that my husband has to have one complete thought in his mind at the time. He sure. can't talk to me when he's driving, for example. Oh, okay. okay. I'm fine with that. Okay, I interesting. We're carrying conversation and still get from point A to point B. Usually. And when we're talking about driving under normal driving circumstances, mm -hmm. um, that tends to be one of those more cognitively simple activities. And so we can do that. We can we can drive and carry on a conversation. But what happens when the car in front of us locks up the brakes? All of a sudden, I can't even hear you anymore, right? And this is the danger that we got into that we all hopefully agree about driving and texting, right, is that the temptation is, well, gosh, 99% of the time that I'm driving, it's just smooth sailing. So I can do this, I'm just reading it, you know. Um, any other thoughts or questions on multitasking? Yeah. I think sometimes, like I have a very busy desk where I work, and so I'm dealing with phone calls and going to my computer, emails, and blah, blah, blah. And so I don't necessarily feel like I'm the ability to multitask, I believe with what you're saying is true, but it's, some people have a faster reaction to go back to what they were working on. Absolutely. And so that, yeah. that's what makes you think, oh, I'm a good multitasker, is because I can go back to what I read and know what I read and I have to re read it all again to start my thought up, whereas I instantly know where yeah. I was back. So you just can see that as <laughs> multitasking when really you just have the ability to be focused right. faster. And certainly in your role, right, like you're just going to be expected to do that role. And, you know, Jessica works on my team and she gets the same thing. It's like, drop everything and do this, you know, what the, uh, this stuff that comes up. And yet, let me ask you this, if you had like a really big project and it had to go out in an hour. I don't take any other distractions. You wouldn't take any distractions. You'd go find a conference room, you'd go down to the corner coffee shop. Has anybody had that experience? Maybe you've got an important paper to write or you've got an important project to work on. So I'm just going to go lock myself away. Um, that, so we know intuitively that, mul that single tasking, that multitasking takes us away from those really important activities. Cool. Okay, the next one is um, this idea of a disciplined life. So sometimes, and this is actually, a, um, we think of this as a character issue, um, which is why there's a lot of stigma related to this, is we look at ourselves probably most harshly and say, oh, I'm just not having the life that I'd like to have. I'm just not as successful as I'd like to be. 
If only I were more disciplined. Am I the only one who's ever felt that way? Have others felt that way? I'm the only one. Okay, so it's me and Jessica. She raised her hand. Okay. Here's what's interesting, is that people who are really, really successful are no more or less disciplined than we are. You hear that? People who are really successful are no more or less disciplined than we are. What they are, what they have done, though, is they've taken what little discipline they have, it's this, the same tiny amount of discipline that sometimes we feel we have, and they've applied it toward building really, really big habits. So this is actually a conversation about habit formation. Now, how long have you heard that it takes to form a habit? 21 days. What else have you heard? What's that? Same thing, 21? Three weeks. I heard three, it weeks. three to build one and 21 to break one. Three to build one. And then 21 days to break it. And 21 days to break it. Good shit, yeah. The slide 66. The slide says 66. Good job, Eric. <laughs> yeah, well done. <laughs> so, um, Aaron got it right. Uh, so, the research at New College, uh, New London College, <coughs> they asked graduate students to form a new health habit. And unless there was a chemical dependency component to it, the average time that it took was 66 days. So I'm going to exercise every day, I'm going to drink more water, I'm going to take, you know, change a diet habit. It took 66 days. So if, if we only give it 21 days, like a lot of us have heard, we're giving up a third of the way into the race. It takes 66 days. So if it takes 66 days to create a habit, how many new habits can you create in a year? What's that? Did you say what? About five or six. Now, that's sometimes discouraging. Ugh, I can only create five or six new habits in a year? Because if you look out and you go, you look at somebody and you go, I want to be successful like that person, right? So you look out and you go, I want to be successful like Bill Gates. I want to be successful like Warren Buffett. I want to be successful like, you know, Oprah, whatever, whoever your person is. You go, man, there's a big gap between me and them. That's a lot of lifestyle change, a lot of habits that I need to change to get from here to there. And I can only get five or six a year. And yet, five or six a year is 50 or 60 a decade. Now, if we could make a list of 60 new habits that would change your life, that you could then apply, you could probably just work on it for 10 years and then quit creating new habits. <clears throat> well, there's another one that's related to it, and it's this idea that willpower is always on will call. So the first idea is, well, if you were just more disciplined, you could be what you want to be. And the second one is, well, if you had more willpower, Except here's the thing on willpower. Willpower is like the battery power on your cell phone. So I plug, when I remember to plug my cell phone at night, I wake up in the morning and what's, what's the battery bar set? 100%, right? It's all full, it's green, it's great. But what happens is I use it throughout the day. It goes down and it gets red and what do I have to do? You guys can talk louder. It's a, we're all, we're all friends here. You gotta charge it, right? So I carry the battery pack around when I go when I travel and stuff like that. So we've gotta charge it up. Well, the same is actually true of our willpower. I want you to start thinking about your willpower, like the battery bar on your cell phone. You wake up in the morning, you have a good breakfast, your, bat, your willpower is full. And if you're trying to create a new habit, it's gonna take an enormous amount of willpower to create a new habit. And, and you know this is true. So has anybody ever tried like um, to change the way that they eat at all? A <clears throat> few of us have. So what happens though is then you have like a rough day, right? Like just things don't go well, you get in a fight with your friend, you get in a car accident, and you get home, and suddenly it's like, what's that? You're eating like a whole thing of ice cream. You're eating, yeah, yeah, an entire half gallon of ice cream. Tub of ice cream. <laughs> yeah, an entire tub of ice cream, right? Well, why? Because our willpower is being used up through the course of the day. And, and until we recharge it, it's going to be really difficult for us to apply it towards that new activity. So this is why you'll hear people say, and I know that it's a losing battle for me to talk about getting up early in the morning, so we're not going to go there today. But your best energy is going to be in the morning. Right? Your best energy is going to be in the morning. So, just real quick, this is my one little um, kind of life hack that I'm putting together. 
everything doesn't matter equally. And we just talked about in school, one of the things that Kaylee identified was that studying was probably that one activity that gives you the most benefit. So I think I've got this college hack figured out, and I need to get somebody to, to try it, because I think it would work out. And then, there's willpower is always on will call, this lie. <coughs> but when do colleges plan all their classes? 8, 9, 10, 11 a.m. It's crazy. Now you can take classes in the afternoon, but nobody ever does. They always take them in the morning. I think that the hack for college, the life hack for college, is to not schedule classes before 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. Yeah? I find that to be true. I took an A&P class from 6 uh -huh. to 9 p.m. Yeah. And I got an A the second term mm -hmm. of taking it 6 to 9, but the first term, um, it was midday, and I, I did much worse. I, got, I, mean, I did like a Well, the thing is, is that when you're in class, you're just reactive. Right? You don't have to bring your you, you don't have to bring your best energy to class. Where you need your best energy is studying outside of class. But where I always ended up studying was at midnight over a cold Domino's pizza. Hmm. Right? So I'm bringing my worst energy to the most important activity. So I think if I can go back and do it again, that the hack on this is to get up, go have breakfast, and then go lock myself in the library for two hours. Okay, I'm not going to, I mean, it, nobody's done the experiment yet, but that's my uh, view on this. So, but here's the idea, two pieces to this willpower thing. One, your willpower is a, a resource. It gets used up. So recognize that. That's actually really empowering once you learn it. Because then, you don't <clears throat> constantly feel, oh, if I just had more willpower. Second, it gets, it gets used up, so we need to refill it. And so... Um, paying close attention to what you eat, like, I mean, this isn't a class about, like, diet and exercise or anything, what I'm just saying, like, carrying around an extra battery when I'm traveling is the same reason that I have extra power bars in my bag when I'm traveling, because I know that my willpower is going to get used up, I know that my best energy is going to get used up, right, that's why the reason we have mixed nuts on the desk, you know? Thoughts? Any thoughts on this one? So is the, the recharge and the low call of that attributed to food? In this particular study,